Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining from today. Thank you for joining our weekly recording of the Digital Transformation Ground Control podcast. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the host of the podcast. I'm also the CEO of Third Stage Consulting Group. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of digital transformation success. And today's topic that we'll be covering today is enterprise technology and supply chain management. So we're going to dive into the intersection of technology, supply chain management, and talk about trends and things to be aware of as you're planning your supply chain and technology initiatives in the coming year or years. Um, I'm going to introduce our guest in just a moment, but before I do, um, just a couple of logistical things. One is that we are, as I mentioned, streaming live to several different platforms. We do this every Tuesday at the same time, same place. So um, be sure to join us for the live recordings. Um, as I mentioned, this recording will become part of our Transformation Ground Control podcast with new episodes that come out every Wednesday. So the recording we're doing here today will become part of the episode that's released next week, a week from tomorrow, uh, Wednesday of next week. Um, so you're part of the live production of the podcast. So thank you for being here today and joining us. Um, secondly, um, this is a global digital transformation community that we typically engage with in these conversations. And as such, we'd love to know where everyone's joining from today. So if you don't mind just dropping in the chat where you're joining from, what city and country you're in, we'd love to hear where you're joining from, where in the world you are today. And um, we're also going to be uh, taking audience questions as we go through the conversation here today. So please drop in the chat at any point along the way, any questions you have for myself or our guest here today. And uh, again, just drop in the chat what city or country you're joining from. So today's topic, enterprise technology and supply chain management. And joining me today is Laura Ciceri from Supply Chain Insights. So Laura, thank you for being here today. Thank you. It's always good to talk about supply chain and technology. What better way to spend uh, a Tuesday morning, right? Right. This. So good. Well, thank you for being here. I guess just to start, this is the, your first time on the uh, podcast and actually the first time you and I have spoken uh, in person or face-to-face. -face. So maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and about your company, if you don't mind. So let's start with who's Laura Ciceri. I am an industry analyst and I like to tell people that Industry analysts that are different than consultants. Consultants know the answers, so congratulations, you know the answers. But industry analysts are trying to figure out the questions. So I triangulate the market. I do primary research with my LinkedIn audience of 324,000 people. And I sit on a database of 25 years of financial data. And so I'm always triangulating to answer the question of, what did people do and did it drive value? And then I write on a blog called The Supply Chain Shaman, which is read by 28,000 people around the world. And I give thanks for that. And I write for Forbes. And I became an analyst uh, through many years of working in supply chain, 20 years of running manufacturing and distribution centers, 15 years building software, and 10 prior years uh, being an industry analyst for Gartner Group and then AMR Research. And that's a little my background. Have I bored you yet? Not at all. I, it, in fact, how I found you is um, I, I read some, I found one of your articles, I think on LinkedIn. And one thing that struck me is how you don't write like most analysts. So in other words, you know, <laughs> what I read from you isn't at all, it doesn't sound like something you would read from Gardner or AMR or some of the places you've worked in the past. So I'm just curious being you know, kind of having your own analyst shop, if you will, does that give you a certain amount of flexibility or more more flexibility and leeway in what you can say and do, even if it runs counter to the the common industry narrative? Well, you know, I don't write like most analysts. It's probably because I have more grammar errors, so, you know, because <laughs> I, I don't have as many editors, right? So what I used to write for Gartner, you know, it would take me three weeks to get an article out, right? Because, you know, you'd go to editor one and review B and uh, you know, at AMR, I used to write weekly and I just like to write. And, um, you know, it's something that I like to tell stories. And I try to tell stories as I write because I think they're memorable. And also I'm known uh, for telling it like it is. I'm kind of, uh, you know, you know, direct and, you know, try to weave in some research and some stories. And, and I think people like the directness and the fact that, Nobody pays me for my ink and I have no advertising on the blog and I give away all of my writing for free because I don't believe research should be behind the firewall. And I hope that it helps people, you know, in my heart of hearts. I hope when they put Laura Ciceri in the grave, somebody's going to say, wow, that gal helped me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that 
that directness is probably is where I, what I was picking up on when I first read your stuff and it, it was uh, unfiltered. It just felt like, you know, it yeah. wasn't censored by a sponsor or anything like that. I mean, you could tell that you're just writing what you believe and what you found and what you, what right. you think versus what someone else wants you to say, which is oftentimes what I get when I read analyst reports. It's kind of like, <laughs> okay, who paid for that report and why are you, <laughs> why, why are you being so positive about um, a right. certain product or whatever the case may be? Um, so, so very interesting. I also read a, Recently, I read an article, one of your articles, I think it was on LinkedIn and your newsletter, which is really good. If, if those of you listening, if you don't subscribe to her newsletter, I highly recommend it. You've got some really good articles on LinkedIn. If you just go to her profile, you can find the, the newsletter there. Um, and what's the name of the, the, the uh, newsletter again? What do you call it? It's uh, Supply Chain Insights Excellence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. It's a great article. And, and you had one on there recently about your tenure, um, not your 10-year-old self, but what you would tell yourself 10 years ago. And in some of the, and this wasn't on my list of questions I told you I was going to ask you, but it just, I just thought of it. Um, what, uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that. Like, what are some of those lessons? Just because I think it's super interesting for the audience to hear what you would have told yourself 10 years ago uh, versus now, if you knew then what you know now. So let me give a little background. Um, 20 years ago, I was asked to be a LinkedIn influencer, which I, at the time I didn't really value because I was like, if people need to get a hold of me, you know, they know my phone number and my email. What's this thing, LinkedIn? And I was a late adopter into LinkedIn, and they asked me to be a LinkedIn influencer, which is a great honor. And I didn't realize it at the time. And, you know, at that point in time, I had 80,000 people that followed me on LinkedIn. And now I'm humbled to have 325,000. And so LinkedIn would give you a question every month to write, you know, a prompt, you know, answer, do a blog. And one was, what would you tell your X self 10 years ago. And so I wrote an article, what would I tell my 50 year old self, which was all about don't take family relationships for granted. At the time I was 50, my mother was alive. You know, I had a great relationship with my daughter. I was happily married, you know, and so I was kind of skipping through life. And, you know, in the 10 years after many of those relationships, you know, disintegrated and you know, I didn't really value, you know, those relationships at the time to the degree that I should have. So that article was all about, you know, recognizing that and what I would tell my 50 year old self. What I would tell my 60 year old self is prepare yourself for aging. Uh, as you age, you know, circle of influence becomes smaller. Many people retire in their 50s. And I find that they struggle with cognitive capabilities and a declining circle of friends. And so, you know, the first thing is, you know, work until you don't want to work anymore, right? So I like doing what I'm doing. And, you know, I make myself work out every day. So I run or swim or lift weights or do ballet in the basement. And I think that's really important because I struggled with uh, osteoporosis. And, um, it's also about, you know, having fun in life and trying to strike the new balance. So I garden and, you know, pursue your activities. And it was funny because, uh, you know, people like those articles. And I, I hope I make somebody's day somewhere over a cup of coffee. Yeah. Yeah, well, it definitely made mine. And um, I thought it was a, a great article and, and sort of a, a reflective article, well-written, very personal. And um, Thank you. It, it, that's, that's what I mean by you're, you don't sound like a typical analyst because I don't think <laughs> I haven't seen any articles from Gardner talking about how, you know, what they would have told themselves 10 years ago. So that's, that's very <laughs> unique that you're doing that. Yeah. Um, I want to um, also thank um, the audience here. Um, just one comment, just while we're getting started here, this is from Mohammed on LinkedIn. Mohammed says, I'm excited to hear Laura speak. I've been following her for quite some time ever since I started working in SOP and demand planning. So at least one person so far that uh, you have influenced and impacted in their career. So um, thank you for being well, here. Thank Mohammed. you. Yeah, I see a lot of people from Colorado and Montreal. And uh, yeah, so it's always good to connect with a global audience, London. Yep, Finland, India, uh, London again, Montreal, Spain. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, dropping in the chat where you're joining from today. Um, just to maybe get started and sort of set the context for the the sort of the meat of the conversation here today, though, is is we talk about uh, trends in the in the tech space. That's a lot of what we talk about on this show. Uh, but we haven't done so in the context of supply chain management in particular. So maybe talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your research and experience as far as the most important trends that you're seeing at that intersection of enterprise technology and supply chain management. I think at the intersection, we're very confused. Uh, I think that, 
you know, supply chain has grown up under some assumptions that are no longer valid. One that if I'm really good at transactional efficiency, I'll be really good at insights. And that has not proven to be true. The global supply chain was also built on the belief that governments would be rational, logistics would always be available, supply would be available, and we just needed to focus on price, and that also is not true, and the variability would be low, and history would be a good predictor of demand and supply. All of those assumptions have been cast to the wind with the combination of war and the horrific nature of what's happening in the world today, and also um, the pandemic. And so as we focus now on this thing called supply chain, that's a complex nonlinear system where we've had an increasing gap in organizations and the ability of companies to really drive effectiveness, people are saying, well, what's next? And I think what's next is the movement from inside out processes where I'm focused on trying to get insights from the enterprise data, which we haven't done very well, to outside in, which is how do I get insights from market data? How do I decrease demand and data latency? Demand latency being the time from purchase at the shelf or the ultimate consumer to an order, which order latency or demand latency has actually increased three times as we've widened the product portfolio and moved into e-commerce. But also data latency, the ability to take data and drive insights. I did a class the other day and one of my participants said, Laura, I've got 1,700 people in my group that have data in their title, but we have no insights. And the reason why we have no insights is we've been slow to adopt Web 2.0 technologies for schema on read versus schema on write and to be able to use very different data sets. 80% of the data surrounding the supply chain is not used. Things like streaming data and unstructured data and image data. And instead, what we've invested in is rows and columns and relational databases and focused on transactional data. And so as we look at how those assumptions are changing and the evolution of the art of the possible, we have this whole world opening up to us about how we can do things better, how we can drive self-service and planning and redefine the role of planners, you know. Planners are sort of like short order cooks, you know, delivering insights to business leaders. But why are business leaders not doing that themselves? It's because we've not designed the systems for that. Or being able to decrease the latency of being able to make decisions faster and better and to be able to drive balance re results easier. So those are some of the trends I'm seeing. Does that help? It does. Yeah. And it, it sounds like you know, more of a, maybe less of a focus on efficiency and transactions and more of a focus on, on more strategic, there's more strategic nature of data and the insights that, that you're talking about there. Well, you know, many people think the efficient supply chain is the most effective and I'm sorry, I'm going to go off here on a tangent, but the efficient supply chain, which is the lowest cost is only good for high volume, very predictable products, which is 20 to 25% of what we produce. And what we have is the need for the responsive supply chain, which is all about short time, you know, whether it's pharmaceuticals or bathing suits or suntan lotion or semiconductors, we have a supply chain that needs to respond very quickly and that can never be low cost. Or the agile supply chain, which is very low volume, very hard to predict. And so what I see in this outside in flow is the ability to do bi-directional orchestration on each of the flows because as we move to the graph and we move to rules-based ontological frameworks, we can model each of those flows very differently outside in. And I find that to be very exciting because the assumption that the efficient supply chain is effective is not true. Right. And it sort of links to a question here from Sam on LinkedIn. Um, do you think that some organizations or most organizations confuse efficiency with effectiveness or they do they just not even think about effectiveness or they are they hyper focused on efficiency well it depends upon the organization i think if you ask any cfo he will automatically say the most efficient supply chain is most effective uh, and so this is the opportunity for us to use network design simulation tools to show the impact of different flows and the impact on the balance sheet most of our decisions have been made on Excel spreadsheets. So we're not able to see the impact of variability 
or the nonlinear relationship of the supply chain. So we must always educate. But, you know, you read the literature, you go to any of the conferences, you'll often hear people talk about the efficient supply chains the most effective. And that is really something we need to challenge and we need to type our supply chain so people can look at things that have high coefficient of variation and volume to be able to say, can I ever manage that efficiently? Hmm. Right. Yeah, it makes makes total sense. Um, you, you know, speaking of this whole, you know, confusion or, or lack of focus on both efficiency and effectiveness, um, one of the things that I found on your, your LinkedIn page, which is very good, not just the newsletter, but you post a lot of documents outlining in detail your research, which I find super fascinating. And it sort of ties back to your point about how you want to make research available to all and not hide it behind a firewall. And you have a lot of detailed data and analysis and all really good like PowerPoint decks and things like that that you posted on your on your LinkedIn page. But one of the things you you talk about in your research is, is supply chains to admire. And I think what you're doing is you're comparing the supply chains you admire. You're comparing that to what Gartner and others are, are saying are, are good supply chains. What can you tell us a little bit about that supply chains to admire list and what some of the key takeaways are from that research you've done? Yeah, so when I was at AMR Research, we developed the, what is now the Gartner Top 25. And it's one of those things where you're in an organization and you don't agree with the direction, but you're overruled. And so right. I worked with a guy by the name of Kevin O'Meara who came up with this Gartner Top 25. And the Gartner Top 25 is based upon the belief that you know what a good supply chain is. And I used to tell Kevin, it really needs to be very research-based, based upon balance sheets. And this Gartner Top 25 is based upon opinion, and it's 25% the analyst opinion, which I never felt comfortable as a Gartner analyst or an AMR analyst, even though I worked with over 600 companies to say that I really knew what excellence was without really looking at balance sheets. And then the other 25% is the commonly held belief of supply chain leaders, and what happens is the people that speak on stage tend to be favored as supply chain leaders like Procter & Gamble, right? Procter & Gamble had 0% growth for the last five years. Can you say that that is a leader, right? Uh, they've paid a lot of money to not grow. And so what I did was I worked with Arizona State University to basically say which factors in a balance scorecard would drive the highest market capitalization and price to tangible book. And I gathered data from a syndicated source called Y charts, and I build what is called orbit charts, which looks at the intersection of the metrics of operating margin and inventory turns and growth and return on invested capital with the belief that the supply chain is a complex nonlinear system. And I study the patterns and I ask the question, is this company driving improvement off the orbit charts, which is a vector analysis? And are they outperforming the peer group in these metrics? Because you must know if they're outperforming the peer group. And if so, they're a supply chain to admire award winner. So it's very much based upon results. It's based upon the questions of, are they driving improvement? Are they outperforming their peer group? And are they driving value on either market capitalization or price to book. And there are only three companies in common with my supply chains to admire. Oh, by the way, I'm currently writing that report that will actually come out for this past period uh, this month. And there are only three companies that have any overlap with the Gartner Top 25. And the companies that have overlap tend to be smaller companies um, and they tend to be less well known. That's super interesting. So I like that because you, it's not, you know, you're taking some of the opinion and guesswork out of it and saying, it, you know, not just because you see someone on a stage speaking or because it sounds like a good supply chain or even on paper, if you look at the operations, it could look like a great supply chain, but you're looking at the actual results. You know, what, what kind of financial results is that supply chain delivering, which I think oftentimes gets overlooked. We tend to think a lot about the more qualitative stuff. You know, what's the qualitative, cool, sexy stuff that a supply chain manager is doing uh, to manage their supply chain. So that's super interesting. Um, yeah. And many of the companies I never knew, right? Like I never knew Asso Abloy, which is uh, really outperforming its category. I never knew um, 
the folks from Sleep Number, right, which is outperforming its category in the furniture market. I didn't really know Cummins Engine as well as I know them now. And so, you know, I think I'm a pretty experienced analyst. You would have a hard time finding somebody who's had more years as an analyst than I have. And so what I find is that I'm constantly surprised by the companies and the strategies that are driving balance sheets. And that's what I think we need to be having discussion about. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of opinions in the industry, but we're not really holding ourselves accountable to say, at the end of the day, what's improving balance sheets, what is improving the environment, and what is improving the welfare of countries. And I think that's what our discussions need to be about. Yeah. Are there, are there any uh, commonalities that you see in these 25 most admired supply chains, like in addition or, or uh, in addition to the results you're talking about, obviously that's the, the key thing you're, you're looking at, but are, are there any sort of other correlations below the numbers that say, you know, Cummins engines or uh, sleep number, these are, these are some of the things they're doing in their supply chain. That's different. That's delivering those results. So after I do the analysis, I interview the companies and what I'm doing is I'm looking for the patterns and the qualitative interviews and I guess there are a couple of things that I always find out. One is they tend to have a lot of innovation at a product level and a process level. So like a sleep number doesn't sell beds. They are trying to improve sleep. And their data on sleep is just as important as their beds. Intuitive Surgical is trying to redefine the surgical market with robots in the operating room. And so they're very connected with uh, product lifecycle management and how they redesign and innovate in the uh, back room. L'Oreal has been a long-term supply chain to admire winner. And one of the things that I love about L'Oreal is they're very regionally focused on beauty and they're very focused at the intersection of new product launch and customer experience and use of the digital data from digital marketing into the supply chain. So each is a little different, but I find that it comes down to the intersection of product launch and supply chain, leadership, clarity around strategy, organizational alignment, uh, which we get there in several different ways, whether it's sales and operations planning or supplier development, and ethics and integrity around the product. Interesting. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, and who knew? You know, some of these companies too, I've heard of them, but I, I didn't know that these were superior supply chain. So that's super fascinating. I'll look forward to reading that report when it comes out. Um, one of the things you talk about in your in your um, LinkedIn newsletter that I saw recently was you talk about misalignment in supply chains. And that's a topic that I'm fascinated by just organizational misalignment in general. And when you think about an organization going through change, and if they're, if they're trying to go through some sort of digital transformation or supply chain transformation, whatever it is, if internally the team is not aligned, that initiative is probably not going to go well. And so I'm always fascinated by this topic and it, it's cool to see that you're, you're focused on it too. And, but you go deep. I mean, you go into, to analyzing um, quantitatively misalignments and what some of the challenges are and you call out manufacturing and procurement as being the two areas that have the biggest misalignments across organizations in general. Um, what can you tell us just about this whole concept of misalignment and supply chain management in, in, in your research and what, what does the research show? Well, first of all, let's talk about the methodology because I'm a research gal, right? And a little bit of a research geek. So for 20 years, I've been asking the same question of how important is it to be aligned between two organizations or two functions and how would you rate your current performance? And so I rate the importance versus the actual performance, and I look at the gap analysis. And I've been asking the same question for the last 20 years, about every other year I'll ask the question. And what I find is that the gap has grown. We've always had a lot of issues between operational teams and the commercial teams. So commercial teams are sales and marketing, operation teams are distribution, planning, manufacturing, and procurement. But 20 years ago, make, source, and deliver were more closely aligned uh, than they are today. And part of that, I think, is the functional enablement of procurement and the fact that procurement has moved to report more through the financial departments without really clear operating strategy, and only 9% of companies actually do 
design. And so as a result of the implementation of SRM, which there is no relationship in SRM, right? I, I don't know how we ever misnamed it. It's all been about, you know, transactions. It's not been about effective supply. It's not been about aggregate buying. And as a result, the purchasing department has become much more functionally focused. And additionally, the manufacturing department has become much more functionally focused. Without design and without clear operating strategy, these two groups have a bigger gap. In addition, you know, the IT organization and its ability to serve operations has grown in its gap. And part of that is IT standardization. When you look at IT standardization and you look at the ramp of what's happening in the art of the possible, either with near AI or generative AI or the graph or ontological thinking, you know, those that are forced into IT standards discussions are very frustrated that they're not able to really get on the train or, you know, be able to embrace these newer technologies. And so that gap is widened as well. And it's got it's widened threefold, which worries me. And uh, the larger the organization, the bigger the gap. I often laugh and say, we have more politics in the global organization than we have in U.S. news. And, you know, that's pretty bad. Right. You know, things are dire when uh, you, you take the, the crown for that, that title. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Um, well, that, that's super fascinating. And, and I, I suppose getting back to sort of the first question you answered about um, the changes in supply chain management with COVID and, and global uncertainty and war, all the stuff that's happening in the world that's disrupting supply chains. When you add misalignment to that, and then you add some sort of technological or transformational uh, initiative on top of that, that's just not a good recipe if you don't get that alignment in, in place first. Um, right. And the first place to start in supply chain discussion is what is excellence? And a lot of times when I ask them that, they look at me like, aren't you the dumbest analyst in the world? <laughs> and maybe you think that, right? That's okay. But, you know, people aren't clear. What is excellence, right? You know, we've added 28 more days of inventory in the past decade across all industries. We should mm -hmm. be proud of that. You know, only 3% of companies outperform their peers on the balance sheet of growth, inventory turns, operating margin, return on invested capital. We shouldn't be proud of that. You know, there is no economy of scale of mergers and acquisitions that we've seen in the last two decades. We shouldn't be proud of that, right? And, you know, as I look at the waste and landfills and I look at things like the percentage of trucks that roll down the road empty, and I look at how many people have great documents on corporate social responsibility, but don't know and don't know how to measure net zero, that's a problem. Or yeah. talk about the bullwhip effect, but don't measure it and don't manage it, and that's a problem, right? Or talk about forecast error without talking about forecast value added, that's a problem, right? Or you know, manage the inventory as both the most important buffer and the most important source of waste. That's a problem, and so I think we got a lot of opportunity. Right. Do you see the organizations that are on your most admired list? Do they do they have, or do you know if they have better alignment? Is that is that one of the patterns that you uncovered as far as they they just are more aligned and more clear on their vision for operations and supply chain management? They're more clear on what is supply chain excellence, which is often around innovation, and they're better aligned because they're driving that agenda. Uh, they also tend to be more regional, which gets to the fact that I don't think we've cracked the nut on the global supply chain. And they tend to be better as a trading partner, you know, with supplier development programs and, you know, the management of, you know, quality of design versus quality of conformance and how they deal with suppliers. And, um, they tend to be better at design. You know, only 9% of companies design their supply chains. And so, you know, they're far more focused on how do they drive value versus how do they minimize cost. Right, right. Here's an interesting question that's, um, that's, that's an interesting one, and it ties to a lot of the topics we cover in this podcast in, in, in other episodes. Um, but this is from Muhammad on LinkedIn, and Muhammad asks for a question with very primitive supply chain operations wanting to move towards digitization. Which supply chain function should be moved to ERP technology first? And I guess let me add to that and say, should it be moved to ERP technology, or are there better ways to 
automate supply chains or what some what are some of the options maybe just what what is your knee-jerk reaction to that whole sort of bucket of question there well i think erp is very important for transactional efficiency of order to cash procure to pay and we wouldn't have grown global supply chains without that mm -hmm. however if i am a small organization i want to be a good trading partner and i want to maximize the value of the third parties around me. So maybe it's a third party logistics, a freight forwarder, uh, perhaps it's a supplier. And what I would want to do is say, you know, what's available to me that I could use easily without having to roll my own or do my own implementations? And how do I learn there? And I wouldn't necessarily copy what we have done in the more established uh, trading countries of the United States or Europe into what you're gonna do there. I would be looking at more cloud-based, more um, you know, outside-in kind of processes. And I'd also be very careful what I call digital because we don't have a consistent definition of digital. And I define digital as the ability to rethink the atoms and electrons of the supply chain, whereas many people define digital as hands-free or uh, without paper. And so, you know, we use a lot of terms and we don't do ourselves any service if we don't define it. So that's how I answer the question. How would you answer the question? Yeah, I, I think it's spot on. And, and I was actually thinking back to a comment you made earlier about or what you were just talking about a few minutes ago about efficiency versus effectiveness. And ERP technology is generally good to drive efficiency. And if we're talking about transactional efficiency, great. ERP is going to potentially help with that. But to your other point about being effective and having insights into your supply chain and really understanding strategically what you're doing and how you can improve it and optimize it, I don't necessarily think ERP is the best route to take there. I, th I know there's supply chain management focused solutions that do a better job of that and you know are doing a better job with analytics and AI and machine learning and things like that that'll maybe do both, you know, sort of the efficiency side of it, but also give you those insights and allow you to focus on effectiveness too. But the first thing you got to say is, what does effectiveness mean? How many supply chains do I have and what are the goals, right? If I'm very focused on time, you know, I want to look at those cycle times. If I'm very focused on, you know, maybe e-commerce or late stage postponement, I want to be able to look at the agile supply chain design. And designing the supply chain for that outcome is, I think, a really important step. And if you don't have the technology to do that, I would invest in getting that design done regularly to be able to look at what the potential of the supply chain is and how you drive outcomes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. What about this goes back to the, um, the alignment question somewhat. Um, this is from Kyler on LinkedIn and Kyler asks, supply chains have been notoriously siloed in organizations. How do you ensure that leadership has effective visibility into supply chain metrics in order to make strategic decisions? Well, you know, we've grown up in silos and they make us feel really comfortable. They define our organizational paths. And many people on the leadership teams don't know make, source, and deliver together. <clears throat> I remember I grew up in manufacturing and I was asked to go run a distribution center. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I can go do that. That's no problem. And the first day I short shipped 220 trucks, right? And I had to go downtown and you know, pay fines because the truckers were clogging up the roads. Well, I didn't know distribution. Very few companies have those cross-functional move career paths that allow people to really understand source, make, and deliver together. So if you're in one of those companies, count yourself as fortunate. The second thing is that most of our network design tools are not used at the board level or the executive team level to help people to understand the inter action between source, make, and deliver. So take those tools to the boardroom, you know, make them get off their Excel spreadsheet and see the impact of variability and to see the volume and variability relationships and the relationship between the metrics. The other thing, and I wrote a book about this, is try to get yourself off of functional metrics like OEE and lowest manufacturing cost and purchase price variance and forecast error and move to reliability metrics in the function, things like forecast value add and inventory health, reducing slow and obsolete inventory, or move from cost to margin so that you're looking at total margin, not just a functional cost, and make yourself do that. And as part of that, then you'll drive a totally different discussion. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, uh, very sound advice for sure. Um, here's a, a, a comment here from Celine on LinkedIn. Celine says, says, good morning, everyone. Great to see Laura as a guest. Her insights on supply chain processes and definition definitions are an eye opener. So you have, uh, your, your fans are, your fans are listening <laughs> in here today. So thank you for, uh, for that comment, Celine. All um, old gals need fans. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Um, that's, that's why we all do this, right. Is to build our fan base. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Kyler has another follow-up question on LinkedIn in terms of what are some red flags when evaluating supply, supply chain management technologies in general, what are, you know, what are some of the sort of pitfalls and risks or mistakes you see organizations make when they go to digitalize their uh, supply chains? The first pitfall is definition, right? What is digital? And then if people fall into the end-to-end -end trap, we really don't have end-to-end -end solutions. You know, we don't have anything in common between DRP and TMS or between MRP and really manufacturing. So we don't have end-to-end -end solutions and we've got a lot of pretty PowerPoints that make us think that we have them. And so you've got to kind of carefully craft your road of, you know, what is you trying to do? If you're saying you're gonna be digital, why and what is the problem you're trying to solve? And what are the best technologies to do that and get out of the PowerPoints and the acronyms test and learn. And when you test and learn, I'm a big advocate of design thinking because the first couple of tests you're going to have, you probably are going to fail and you're going to need as an organization to celebrate failure. And you're going to have to work with the organization to say, as I'm on this path, I don't want to be hamstrung by either a fixed ROI or a project plan, but I want to solve a business problem. And, you know, on that journey, you know, help people to learn what you're learning and then drive that improvement. Right. But what I see so often is people will get a consultant that really doesn't understand supply chain with pretty words and pretty PowerPoints and put an RFP in the market, which is usually very badly written and then chase a very badly written RFP and the project doesn't work. You know, I think it's telling that in the pandemic, 93% of the decisions were made on Excel spreadsheets, even though 95% of companies have advanced planning. That's not a good statement, right? Mm. It's because wow. we poorly implemented and we didn't design those systems for the level of variability that we experienced in the pandemic. And even now, order history is not such that we can use conventional demand planning well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not not something to be proud of to use your term from earlier, uh, earlier in the conversation. Um, you talk about in your writings, I, th I believe on LinkedIn is where I saw this, but you talk about the need for a supply chain reset. What, what is a supply chain reset? And why do you think this concept is so important in today's day and age? Well, I think the supply chain reset says, how do I take advantage of the art of the possible or the newer technologies? and really drive insights and decrease the latency for decisions and improve decisions. So number one, we don't measure the quality of the decisions, right? And when we implement, whether it's advanced planning or SRM or CRM, we don't really measure, are we making better decisions? Are we making better decisions quickly? Are we making better decisions on market data? We typically implement the systems and we look at, efficiency, you know, of, you know, how many people or, you know, how quickly I do a batch job. So one is evaluate work and how should we really redesign work? The second thing is, as we look at the supply chain reset and we look at those assumptions I talked about earlier with, you know, that governments would be rational, that logistics and supply would be readily available and that variability would be low look at how we go from inside out processes to outside in processes to decrease that latency and use the data. In that process, you're gonna find that most of what we invested in, which are relational database kind of companies really hamstrung by the fact that our in-memory logic in those relational databases was so limited, you'll find that most of that technology will be legacy. But if you can free yourself up to look at what data do I have? What data do I need? What questions am I answering? 
and look at the newer technologies of the graph and ontological frameworks and NoSQL, there's a great opportunity for those outside in processes to shorten latency, drive insights, and really drive value. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And, and along those lines too, you posted an article, it was, it was a bit dated. I think you wrote it in 2020, if I remember correctly, but you were talking about the um, supply chains of 2030. And sort of your mm -hmm. predictions for what supply chains are going to look like. And I imagine, I'm just going to assume that since you wrote that article, and maybe you have a newer one that I didn't see, but since you wrote that article, I have to imagine things have probably changed in your mind or in your analysis of supply chain management, given all the macro trends that you talked about with war happening now and the pandemic, et cetera. But what, how would you describe or how, what are some of the big trends you're seeing that you think are going to sort of become more and more relevant in the coming years and, and what is the supply chain of 2030 and beyond? What, what does that look like in your opinion? Well, and what would I like it to look like? Um, you know, this concept of self-service I think is a really important one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have self-service HR and uh, we have self-service procurement. Why do we not have self-service planning? You know, I work with companies in 2002, they had 200 planners. 2007, they had 400 planners. 2019, they had 1,700 planners. Today, they have 2,500 planners. I mean, like, what is wrong with that picture? If you have that kind of growth in planners, we're becoming very reactive. We're not becoming responsive. We're not really driving insights. So how did we get caught in this loop of planners really chasing data versus systems driving insights and business leaders able to get their own data. So I want to redesign work for self-service planning and insights where we can sense and respond and we can do that more effectively. Now, some people might say, well, Laura, the answer there is generative AI. And I think we're a long ways away from generative AI driving the supply chain. I think generative AI can help us with reporting, uh, you know, self-service reporting. But I think NARA AI and the graph offer us a great opportunity to manage flow, which I think the more advanced supply chains manage flow and they manage transactions and they manage them together along with insights. And then uh, the models are different based upon flow. And right now we're talking about engines, not really talking about learning models. And so as we think about models that learn, and we think about models that learn with all kinds of data, whether it's unstructured data or image data or streaming data, and we can solve new problems and we have to be open to that. Right. Yeah. It sounds reasonable. And, and uh, is there a, do you think there's a disconnect between where you think supply chains will go and where you want them to go? I... You know, I... You know, I, I'm not, I don't flatter myself that, you know, where I want them to go is where they're going to go. I'm frustrated that our level of innovation is so low and our level of understanding is so low. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was an industry analyst at a company called AMR Research uh, about 2005, I asked the question in a quantitative research piece of how many companies considered themselves innovators and how many considered themselves late adopters and laggards. And I was Frustrated when I was Gartner, was, I was at Gartner because Gartner really talks to the late adopter CIO, and that's not my audience. And at that point in time, I had a bell curve of equal number of innovative companies as late adopters. What's happened is a skewed distribution as people have focused on IT standardization, whereas only seven percent of companies today consider themselves innovators. And I think we've got to innovate ourselves out of the problems of. ESG and, you know, tight supply and feeding the world. Uh, I think it requires innovation. And my frustration is we aren't doing enough process innovation. We're doing product innovation. We're not doing enough test and learn with new technologies. So will 2030 look like what Laura Ciceri wants it to be? I don't know, but I'm hoping we can solve big problems. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of these problems have sort of been percolating for a long time. It seems like since, um, you know, the eighties and nineties when supply chain management really became a thing and, you know, organizations built these big global supply chains, you know, that was 30 plus years ago. And in many ways, the supply chains haven't changed fast enough, you know, to keep up with some of these realities that we're facing today. 
1982 was when we first wrote about supply chain as source, make, and deliver together. And if only we were able to achieve that objective, right? Right. Now, you talked about um, AI a moment ago, generative AI. And this is a question from Ryan on LinkedIn. And Ryan asked a question that's related to that thread, which is how do you envision the role of AI in driving advancements in supply chain management while concurrently ensuring the security integrity of data? What are your thoughts of AI in general, you know, within supply chain management? Well, I'm first of all, I'm amazed that people are so excited about AI and don't really understand Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 tools and technologies and capabilities, right? So I'm just fascinated what, you know, lights the hype cycle. Second thing is when people talk about AI, I talk about, well, what does it mean to you, right? You know, and uh, how do you define it? And most people are pretty sloppy in their definitions and they're saying generative AI without really thinking about, we're not ready for generative AI. If only 2% of companies are clear on their operating strategy and 9% of companies design their supply chain, if you let generative AI loose, it would be like, you know, my dog's loose in the kitchen, right? I mean, it would be, you know, just pandemonium because generative AI is not able to discern political bias. It's not able to discern, you know, the truth. And so, what we've got to do is get really clear on what is supply chain excellence and how do we design the supply chain for flow before we can ever be ready for generative AI. So I think generative AI will be good for content development, things like training manuals or product use manuals or you know self-service reporting, but not really to drive engines in the supply chain. Nara AI, on the other hand, which is more of a bounded model, uh, it's you know using pattern recognition, you know to define the inputs, and then Nara AI is giving you the outputs. Really, very excited about that as an engine choice, but the graph I think is extremely powerful. And one of my frustrations is there are a lot of companies that are starting to do work on a graph to be able to look at nodes and flow. But people aren't ready to change their mindset from transactional rows and columns to flow. And as a result, what's happening is the companies that are building on the graph are just really replicating the processes that were based on transactions, rows and columns. And, you know, we're not moving fast enough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Makes makes total sense. And there's also, um, you know, the back to to Ryan's uh second part of his question, he talks about security and data integrity and things of that nature. Um, that's a whole nother can of worms or a whole nother problem area that, that organizations have to think about, not just securing, uh, ensuring that the data that they're using, not just for AI, but analytics in general, you obviously have to make sure the data is accurate and you're capturing data accurately. But then you've got the security issue of if I use generative AI to in an open AI model to create a report or to give me some insights that I'm not getting out of my core enterprise technologies, that potentially exposes, you know, that data to being not confidential or out in the, you know, kind of the public source, if you will. Right. And, you know, we've got a lot of security breach issues. I don't know if you've read about the Clorox write-off of over 500 million, right, mm -hmm. due to the breach issues, right? And so we've also got to train employees. So, you know, there are an awful lot of people that are trying to get your passwords and trying to get into our systems. And, all systems, you know, can be, you know, tampered with, whether it's a manufacturing system or a robot in the warehouse or, you know, a trucker, right? We've got a lot of software that can be tampered. And so security needs to be not only technology buttoned up, but, you know, our employees need to be very aware too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how do you think, um, back to the point we had earlier, the thread we were talking about earlier as it relates to enterprise technology. Um, how do you think the enterprise technology space will respond or evolve to address some of these supply chain trends that you're talking about? Or, or do you think they're, the, they will evolve? I mean, how, how are the vendors in general responding to these needs and providing tools and data and all the stuff that you're talking about here today? Well, it's hard for me to talk generally about supply chain because, you know, I've got different spaces I follow. One is planning. And, you know, the failure of SAP and APO and the movement to IBP gave great lift to companies like Canaxis and 09 and OMP. And, you know, my fear is that those companies see it, that they're doing a lot of things right versus, you know, 
that failure lifted their boats. And so, you know, as they have lots of customer activity, I worry that they're not driving enough innovation. Mm. And then I have the networks that are starting to grow up, whether it's Everstream Analytics or Supply On or One Network or, um, you know, the work that, you know, the National Association of Manufacturing is trying to do on networks. Those need to really drive interoperability, just not focus on integration, where we're actually moving the semantic layer and we're looking at, you know, how do we have single sign on? Because we have no interoperability between networks. And I do an open uh, call every month where we talk about what's happening in the network technologies and how do we move from integration to interoperability and really build networks because we're not doing very well on building networks. In the supply chain execution space where I've got a lot of streaming data coming in from, you know, four kites and project 44, et cetera. We're bringing that into kind of dead ends that we call control towers, right? Which we're not really controlling anything there and we're really not driving visibility. And what we need to have happen is those solutions need to get on with it and redefine transportation management so that we're able to look that route guides and first pass tender as we do it today is really obsolete. And then as we deal with manufacturing environment, and we deal with the Internet of Things and we deal with, you know, the automation of manufacturing and the automation of distribution centers. You know, we need to be able to reskill our workers so that we can deal with the Internet of Things and we can redefine things like predictive maintenance and we can redefine, you know, how we actually manage our warehouse for real time perpetual inventory. You know, I work with a company that has. 44 Manhattan systems, you might think, well, it'd be easy to roll up a perpetual inventory signal. Well, it takes them eight hours, right? Because mm -hmm. each of those Manhattan systems has a different configuration, a different batch job. And so getting to a real-time perpetual inventory signal allows us to really open up the world for rules and policy for multi-channel. So, you know, I think that on one hand, we've got a lot of excitement, a lot of opportunity. On the other hand, we've got slow adoption. And so I want us just to get on with it. I think it's going to take big impetus, right? Uh, either, you know, we're going to be taxed for, you know, scope three emissions and people are going to have to get serious about measuring net zero, or we're going to have to face the fact that we can't feed the world population and get on with, you know, how we manage the food supply chain or we're going to you know, continue down this unfortunate path of war where we're just not able to get enough ammunition right now because we manage the um, warfare supply chain as an efficient supply chain, which really needs to be responsive to get enough ammunition. So I think it depends upon the thrust that are thrust upon the supply chain to the level we're going to drive innovation. Right, yeah, that's, that's super interesting. And you, know, you touch on, uh, some things that, you know, maybe is a, a good place to start or, you know, something I, I, I could better explain supply chain management to our audience related to it, which is that supply chain management is so critical. I mean, it's, it's critical in so many ways. You talk about feeding the world, you talk about its impact on the environment. Those are two really big sort of social issues that supply chain management um, can address, even if it's for profit motives that are dry, you know, that are enabling that. Um, so I think that that's interesting. Are you seeing more, um, you talk about the environment a couple of times now in the net zero, um, philosophy, um, that you mentioned earlier, do you, are most supply chains and most organizations managing supply chains? Are they, is that a general focus? I know you said there's some misalignment, you know, they say it on paper that in the environment's important, sustainability is important, but then they're driving empty trucks and empty containers are coming back, you know, from other countries or whatever, some things that run counter to that, that sort of misalignment. What, where do you see sustainability in the environment sort of fitting into supply chain management now and in the future? Well, it's more important and it's more important really for three reasons. One, we don't have as much of base resources, whether it's water or, you know, yield or, um, you know, supply, right? And we're not necessarily managing that fourth moment of truth of recycle and circularity, right? You know, we still are throwing a lot of stuff into landfills and not really conserving water to the degree we're going to have to. So that's first, you know, is limited resources. But the second is 
potential taxation and the discipline around ownership of the planet, which I think is going to happen. And we're very exposed because, you know, we're not measuring net zero. We're not measuring the bulwark effect. We're not managing the waste streams in our supply chain. And people are going to wake up and go, I've been investing in enterprise systems, but I haven't really invested in the networks. And the networks are old technology. They're EDI. We've been slow to really embrace, you know, what could happen with those networks if we could drive interoperability. There is no way to get from Ariba to Alimica to eat open in today's systems. There is, you know, not the automation of source make and deliver together. I've got some networks like Nology who automate manufacturing, some that automate sourcing, but nothing that really helps me move across source make and deliver easily. So there's an opportunity for us to really redefine those networks and do that more effectively. Yeah. So these are some thoughts. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about not just from an environmental sustainability perspective, but just in general, when you look at a supply chain, you, you bring up a great point, which is the network. You know, you have to look at the entire network, not just what's going on inside your four walls or with your own fleets and your own assets. Um, it's it's so much more than that. It's so interconnected and that interoperability that you mentioned becomes so so critical. Um, so good, good, good points for sure. Um, I want to thank you for being here. This is uh, time flew by and we are already up against our hour. So I, I thank you so much for, for being here. This was a really good conversation. I'd love to have you back. There's so many more questions that I have that I did not ask you. And uh, I know the audience had a lot of questions here, especially around SNOP and some other things we didn't get to. So I'd love to have you back if you're open to it. And I want to thank you very much for being here, Laura. You, you, thank you for your happy. time. Thank you for having me. And I'd love to come back. Absolutely. I've learned a lot. I hope the audience has too. I want to thank the audience for the great questions too. You can find this uh, polished up, edited interview. Not that we're going to edit anything. You didn't say anything that was offensive that we have to edit, but you know we're going to polish it up and make it look pretty and everything like that and make it part of our uh, weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast. And that episode will come out a week from tomorrow. You can find Transformation Ground Control at transformationgroundcontrol.com or you can go to Apple Podcasts and Amazon Podcasts, all the podcast platforms to find it there as well. And we also stream it to YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter as well. So look, look, look for that episode coming out next week. Um, thank you again, everyone. Hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time on our weekly live stream. Take care, everyone. Thanks again, Laura. Thank you.